so the um uh we've got two models of maturation the one is concerned with attention and the second is concerned what well, actually the first is concerned with intention and the second is concerned with attention um uh, and in fact the work uh, originated in terms of our understanding as understanding of attend intention these are these are two these two frameworks are clearly related because i mean intention and attention are related problems what's significant to you intention is concerned with what's significant to you is obviously going to drive what you give attention to so intention and attention are related they they kind of they they sibling problems um, um so we're going to, I'm going to start off just by giving a thumbnail sketch, very, very quick uh, thumbnail sketch into the issue of intent and also try and explain why it is that we needed a greater level of sophistication to understand maturity by looking at the eight stations of attention. So the, 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 if you're looking at the, the, this, the, the intent model of maturation, it basically looks at the problem of maturation from a, as an absolutely linear progression from being immature to being mature. Um, uh, and, and if you look at it from that point of view, it provides you with a straight line. I mean, if you, if you see maturation as a process, then basically it indicates that, you know, like any process, whether it's a metabolic process or um, a, an administrative post process or a production process, if you use the word process to describe something, what you're describing is an incremental move from a beginning to an end. So if you look at the problem of maturation from that point of view, then, then, um, then, then basically what we're saying is that as we mature, we kind of, we, we start off, you know, the process of maturation is an incremental move from birth to death. Um, because, you know, like any process, it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere and you can describe it as an incremental move from the beginning to the end. Now, you'll notice that I've indicated get and give at those two extremes and the rationale is the following. At birth, the infant has had nothing. So whatever the infant is going to get, the infant will still get, which means at birth, the infant is yet to get in the most unconditional sense of the word. When you die, you can't take anything with you. In other words, when you die, you give unconditionally. Now, people might say, but when I die, I don't give anything. Everything gets taken away from me. That obviously is true. But from the point of view of intent, this, however, is very significant. Because, you know, if you have a thousand rand stolen from you or you give somebody a thousand rand, the difference does not sit in the objective event. It doesn't sit in the thousand rand. It sits in the intent of the person who's going through the experience. And, and if you view the loss of the thousand rand as predictable, it's definitely going to happen. Then clearly the person who intends to give the thousand rand has the most has the kind of has the affirming experience, and the person who has the thousand rand taken from you has a negating experience. And if we view death in the same way as the loss of the thousand rand. The question is, you know, which one of these two is kind of the acceptable experience? And clearly it's where the thousand rand gets given, which basically means to say the process of maturation is concerned with the process of the maturation of the intent to give unconditionally. And when we use the word process, we are indicating increments. And another way of describing increments, the incremental move from birth to the death, is to say that it's various shades of gray, and gray is clearly a mixture between light and dark. So basically, what changes as you mature is an incremental shift of your intent to get to intent to give as kind of like various shades of gray. So when you, when you, when you, when you comparatively immature, then more frequently than not, you will give attention to what you're getting. But when you comparatively mature, then more frequently than not, you give attention to what you're giving. So this, this model of maturation that actually sees maturation as a maturation of intent is very useful. It's very simple because it's linear. It basically, is, it, it's a straight line thinking going from birth to death, getting to giving, and, 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 and is very helpful to give one some understanding of what this kind of, uh, you, know, you know, what the dynamics are in the process of maturation. It has a shortcoming, though. And the shortcoming is its simplicity. I mean, you can, you can cut this process into epochs. You can say, you know, if they say up to, say, 
you know, this is 50% darkness in the shade. You know, prior to this is, is up to 49% darkness in the shade, you know, beyond 51% light in the shade. So, so you can say, so you can say this, you know, this is then up to say 25% darkness, that's up to 50% light, uh, that's up to sort of 25% light, 50% light, and so on. Now, the linguistic equivalent of that is, at the beginning, you're saying, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the most primitive way in which your intent can operate says, I'm here to get, and then it says, I give to get, and then it says, I get to give, and then it says, I'm here to give unconditionally. Now, this, this statement, I'm here to give unconditionally, is a problematic statement. Because when you give and it's truly unconditional, it has to mean no interest in an outcome. I give to give, you know, giving to give away. But the problem with the word intent is that the word intent wants an outcome. So, so actually, the latter end of maturation is very difficult to understand through the language of intent because the language of intent can't really give you a framework to explore truly unconditional motive which is why we need a more sophisticated language, particularly to explore the latter parts of our maturation journey. That sophisticated language is concerned with attention. Now, uh, just actually just to set this up, the, we, have, we have, in a sense, anything that exists, exists at the, sort of at the intersection of two variables. It exists both in time and it exists in a place, time and place. Or, you know, because, I mean, if something has a place but it doesn't have a time, then it isn't. And if something has a time and it doesn't have a place, it also isn't. You require both a time and a place. We engage time from the point of view of intent. Intent is concerned with how we engage time or how we engage now. Because the issue of intent is so concerned with outcomes. It's so concerned with things. You, you know, if I ask you, what do you intend to do? You're always looking forward. You, the word intent wants an outcome. The issue of attention is concerned with how we engage space or here. Now, when you're trying to understand how your intention engages the situation that you're in right now, there's, a, there's kind of a complexity to this. It's a complexity that you cannot reduce to just two variables, to a single, um, uh, uh, to sort of, sorry, a single continuum between two binary opposites. And um, because the, the, first, the first distinction that you've got to bear in mind if you're trying to map attention is you've got to understand that all, all attention is concerned with the engagement between the looker and the, the seer and the seen, the inward and the outward. And I mean, I know we've done this a hundred times in various things that you've done with me, but what I'd like you to do is just do the exercise again. We call it the window of attention exercise. So look straight ahead of you and let your, your fingers trace the limit, the boundary at the limit of your peripheral vision. You just do that. If you don't mind, I, I know everybody's going to think you're mad standing in front of a, a computer screen sort of waving like this, but just because you know, it gives me a reference point. Draw the boundary at the limit of your peripheral vision. Now, consider that boundary. That boundary operates like a window frame, which is why we refer to that boundary as the window of perception. That if, everything that you could see, everything that you could uh, experience visually, perceive visually, gets presented to you inside that window in front of you. That window is therefore a fundamental dividing line between two very different places. First of all, there's that which you can see, which gets presented in front of you inside this window. Uh, secondly, <laughs> Uh, secondly, there's, there's you, there's the perceiver, there's the person sitting, so, so, so this window is the fundamental dividing line between two very different worlds. There's, there's the perceiver, the one that's looking on, on this side of the window, and there's that which is seen on that side of the window. 
the seer and the seen, the perceiver and the perceived, the inward and the outward. Now, um, I'm just going to see, because there's some complaints about unmuted mics. I'll just mute them. Uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, so, the, the, now, unfortunately, that single set of binary opposites aren't adequate to account for the relationship for, for, for attention itself. Because not only do you have to account for the distinction between the seer and the seen, the inward and the outward, you also have to account for why it is that you get to see. Now, what I mean by this is if you just think about everything, if we just work visually for now, so consider everything that is inside your window of perception and view it almost like, like, um, like a canvas. Hmm? It's a circular canvas. So everything that's presented to you visually is in that. If, if you saw absolutely everything as the same in this window, you would basically be blind because you'd just be looking at a wash of color that's like a big mix, like soup. Why is it that you see objects? Why is it that you can pull things into the foreground and push things into the background? Because without that, you're as good as blind. If you weren't doing that, if you weren't all the time actually designating what is significant and what isn't significant, it doesn't matter that you're seeing, you'd still be as good as blind. So you've got, if you're trying to account for how attention works, there's a second binary opposite that you've got to understand or take into account. And that's the distinction between the significant and the insignificant. So if you want an adequate compass that helps you to understand the mapping of attention, that compass cannot just refer to the distinction between the inward and the outward. That compass also has to distinguish between that which is significant and that which is insignificant. Because attention, that doesn't discriminate between the significant and the insignificant is no longer attention. It is blindness. It is, it is because attention is concerned with perceiving something. I give attention, I therefore perceive something. But if you aren't, if you aren't designating what is perceivable, if you aren't designating what is significant, then you, are, then you don't see it. So I'll give you an example. If, um, if you treated absolutely all the visual stimulus coming to you as you're walking down the street as the same, you will walk into people because you wouldn't distinguish between the person and the gap that's not the person. You would walk into them, you'd see it as all the same. The reason why you don't walk into the person is because you can distinguish the person from what's around them. Without this ability to distinguish the thing from what isn't the thing, Without this ability to circumscribe a boundary to things, your attention is useless. Your attention is driven by the distinction between the significant and the insignificant. So, a map that accounts for attention cannot just operate a single set of binary opposites. It cannot just look at like intention does. It's a single set of binary opposites. Birth, death, getting, giving. Attention, you can't do that with. With attention, you've got to have a, com there's a complexity to the problem because you haven't accounted for attention just by, by referring to the difference between the inward and the outward. You also have to refer to the difference between what is significant and what isn't significant. If that is our basic compass of, of attention, then the next question is, um, uh, you know, uh, these, these, what, what does that imply for the journey of maturation? What does this compass imply for the journey of maturation? And without kind of wanting to seem to be kind of silly, kind of wisecracky, our journey of maturation is from how things appear to how things appear. Now, this statement, how things appear, actually has two very different significances, two very different implications. You can first understand that phrase, how things appear, 
to describe how things seem to be. And there's an, there's a, there's, um, there's an implication in phrasing it like that, which seems to suggest illusion. You know, you know, like if I say to you, well, that man's a very nice man. You say, well, that's just how he seems to be. You know, in other words, he's actually a rotter. You just don't understand. I mean, you don't, you, you're just going by appearances. So that's, that's the one way in which you can understand that phrase, how things appear. From, in other words, it's how things seem to be. However, there's another way that you can understand that phrase. And that is not how things seem to be, but how things appear. How do things appear? Isn't that amazing that you aren't blind? I mean, how is it that you, you don't walk into the person? Uh, how is it that you manage to choose the gaps between the people as you're walking down the road and you're not walking into the people? How is it that they appear to you? By what mechanism do they appear to you? So, so, th so our journey is from how things seem to be, how things appear, to how things appear. In other words, how things actually get to be seen. Now, we start off, the fundamental logic of this is that we start off the, and to understand how things appear, we need to understand two fundamentally different binary opposites. First of all, there's a place that you could call gatheredness. Now, gatheredness is the, 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 is the, is the inward. It is, it is the, so, so, the one implication of the word gatheredness is that it is the place where your perception gathers to. In other words, there's, you can almost see it, you working visually again. It's almost like from the corners of your eyes. There's like a, there's like a funnel that goes up that gathers all the light to your eyes, kind of gets, gets assembled behind your eye for you to be able to see something. So the inward is the place where stimulus is gathered to is brought into, is consolidated so that it is perceived. The other implication of this, this, this idea of gatheredness, and I'd like you to really bear this in mind from the point of view of our understanding of Tasso, is this is the, also the place of intimacy. Gatheredness also means like the gatheredness on the mother's lap. And you can also describe it as the gatheredness of the rosebud, the kind of the, 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 the neophyte condition, the small condition, the place where everything gets pulled in. So that's, that's this realm, the realm of the inward uh, and uh, 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 of the insignificance. Whereas the realm of the outward is, exact, is the exact opposite. The realm of the outward is the realm of separation. It is the, the out there. Uh, and so in the first con the first idea of the idea of separation is that it is it's 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 um it's so so if gatheredness is intimacy it's closeness here yeah, separation there's alienation it's that which is seen it's on the other side it's not on the, this side of the perception it's on the that side of perception it's also permanently different it's all it's permanently so it's almost the exact opposite of the of, of the scene of the seer. So uh, one way of describing the relationship between me and the world, because you can see the the the, the this is this is the world. This is what I see. One way of understanding my relationship with the world or the relationship of the seer with the world is let's just compare sizes. You know, I mean, how big are you with regard to everything that isn't you? Well, it might not have occurred to you, but you're actually very very small. You're the small, intimate little place contrasted with this vast thing out there, this separate thing out there, this overpowering thing out there, this, 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 this abnegating thing, this overwhelming thing out there. So, so understand separation is the exact binary opposite to gatheredness. And how it appears to us, we say, so we go from how things appear, hey? how it appears to us initially as we grow into the world, we have the sense that I'm very small and I'm dominated by all of that out there, that that is very big. So it's the, that, the, the, that out there defines me, that out there produces me, that out there, I'm the victim, I'm the produced, it is the big, I'm the small, it is the overwhelming, 
I'm the, the vulnerable. However you want to pattern those binary opposites, that's exactly what, how you experience it over time. However, I shouldn't have said that over time. Over time, we have the opposite understanding. We get to understand that anything that you see in the outward is only seen because it has a form. So why do you see the man or the woman? Because the, there's an outline that your eye traces that distinguishes the woman from the chair they're sitting at. I mean, think about this. If you looked at somebody who was sitting in a chair and you didn't at some level recognize the distinction between the person and the chair, you would just see one thing. Um, and this is a learned skill, by the way. So there's an apocryphal story. I don't know how true it is that the very first Khoisan people who saw people riding horses uh, in South Africa were horrified because they thought this was one creature. They thought this horse, it was like, a, um, what do you call the centaur? It was like, oh, this horse had two heads and the one head was a person's head and the other, and you, you know what I mean? So when they, that's what they thought when they saw a horse. A two, it is because their eye didn't learn that hold on, a horse and a person are separate. So why is it that you don't that you don't see the person in the chair as the same? Because you the thing has a form. But the issue with that form, the outwardness of anything that you can see, the form that anything has, the problem with that is that it 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 only exists because you designate it. You provide it. It's it is the I go back to the example of the relationship of, of the people who first saw um, uh, whites on horses, the Khoisan who first saw, who thought they were looking at a single creature. Because in their heads, they couldn't, there wasn't this, there wasn't a category called man and beast, man riding beast. So it was one thing, it was man beast. Um, so the, it is that you see based on the meaning that you ascribe to things. In other words, it appears, how things appear when you start this journey is that it appears as if you the very small thing defined by the big out there. In fact, the out there is the, any form that you can see is, is defined by you. It is the meaning that you ascribe on the inside that produces the world. So how things appear is that the world produces you and this is how we start our journey. How things appear Actually, once you start understanding how things get to appear, how you get to see them, you start to recognize that you produce the world. The world does not produce you. You are not the microcosm. You are the macrocosm. This is the journey. This is the journey of discovering who you are. Now, the eight stations gives us a really useful map to understand that journey and particularly to navigate the latter ends of it. So the, the intent model is really helpful to understand the beginning of how we kind of grow from being infants to being children, to being adolescents, to being um, adults who are uh, kind of, you know, uh, sort of still fending for our, ourselves and our families. So what the attention model gives us and uh, uh, toolage to work with is the latter end of our maturation. You know, what are, what are the epochs that, that, how do the epochs look where, you're, where the language of intent breaks down, where the language of condition and conditional motive break down? You know. you see, intent is always the small thing trying to fix things, make the world work. But how do you deal with the being who no longer, who, who's, who's no longer assailable, who's so vast, who, the, who understands that I'm not under threat by the world. The world is my product. I'm not the big, small one. I'm the big one. You know, there's this vastness over here that cannot be overwhelmed. That person no longer has an interest in fixing anything. That person no longer has an interest in changing anything. So that's why if you're on this path, I think it's very useful to have these two models of maturation. The one is to understand maturation is a maturation of intent. The second is to understand maturation is a maturation of attention. Folks, that was 
just under half an hour. I hope this was useful. I will look at the, um, the, uh, the chat box, take a few questions. Um, so, so hold on, maybe if I, if I may, just say this last thing before we roll. What we're going to do in the next eight iterations is we're going to look at each one of these stations. Because we, we, as we mature, we journey through what we could call eight stations of attention. And I'll just let the cat out of the bag with regard to the first one. I've obviously done something here. I'm making marks. <laughs> yeah, so, the, eight, the, the, the first station is the station of the, the newborn infant. Now, I would like you to go out today and tomorrow and think about that image over there. In fact, what I'll do is I'll take a, a screenshot of that image and I'll send it to you. Um, uh, I'd like you to consider that image and um, I'd like you to, to say, well, 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 if this is, this is the first station we start off at, this is the station of the infant, the newborn infant. Why would we call it significant? You know, why is it pinned between these two binary opposites of inward and outward? Think about that. And so we will take each station. I'd like you to do some thinking about it. And then I will do a presentation on just on that station. And then maybe we'll see if we can open the mics. Maybe by some, that stage, some people have fled and are no, no longer interested. We'll open the mics and then we'll take some debate on it. Or we can then just do it on the chat box. Um, so that's the intention for the rest of the process, folks. But thank you very much. You've been very generous uh, to kind of avail yourselves to this. I beg your pardon, you shouldn't have seen that. Uh, right, so um, are there... Um, Okay, so uh, Fahrsa would like me to do a quick review before I finish. Uh, uh, just of the eight, uh, eight attentions. Um, uh, so, uh, let's look at it like this then. So, we're saying that if you want to account for attention, the first thing you've got to understand is the difference between the inward and the outward. That's the, that's the first binary opposite you have to bear in mind if you're trying to understand how attention operates. The difference between the seer and the seen, the observer and the observed. That which is this side of the window of perception and that side of the window of perception. You haven't yet accounted for attention properly until you also bear in mind the distinct distinction between that which is significant and that which is insignificant. Because without distinguishes that which is significant and that which is insignificant, actually attention is also not operable. Because, because then you're as good as blinded. You, you know, a blind person directing their attention, their visual attention to something is useless. So you also have to distinguish between what's significant and what's insignificant. Otherwise, your attention is useless. This creates four areas, four realms, but the journey is a journey of how things, from how things appear to how things appear. So first of all, it appears as if this place of smallness and gatheredness is under threat by that which is vast and out there. It seems as if this is the subordinate, I am the subordinate, and that out there is the super, the big, the vast, overwhelming, as, you know, it defines me. When I have, when I, when, as I mature, I'm, I no longer, I, I, I'm no longer sort of sort of deluded by how things appear. I understand how things get to appear. And when I understand that things get to appear, I understand that everything that exists out there only exists because I, it has a form. And it only has a form because I have designated it as a form. It is the meaning that I ascribe to things on the inside that produces the form out there. Which is then, in other words, it's no longer me being produced by the world. It is me producing the world. It's no longer me being subordinate to the world. You know, it's no longer me being the microcosm. I've become the macrocosm. And that's the journey. And, uh, and finally, the first station we're going to speak about tomorrow is the station of the, of the infant. It's called the station of the insignificant. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it says, uh, I beg your pardon. Uh...
Sorry, I messed up there. So uh, I'll go to the chat box. Uh, is there? Um, but I, I, I think it's probably good enough for now. Hey? Thank you very much, folks. I pray that Allah protects you all, grants you all um, uh, a period of great uh, opening um, uh, and development. Um, what you can do, actually, this is a way of doing this. You can mail me. You've all got my email address because I sent it to you. If you have any questions that occur to you afterwards, you can mail me and we'll discuss those questions tomorrow when we kick off looking at the first station. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.